Okay, so today we're starting a new medieval thinker who's not that distant from St. Anselm. Uh, remember, we jumped ahead about a thousand years from Epictetus to Anselm, and now we're sort of slowing it down a little bit. This is in the Middle Ages. Um, St. Anselm was sort of at the very end of what, what some people call the Dark Ages, and now we're into the High Middle Ages. And now we're talking about this guy, Thomas Aquinas. And Thomas was a Dominican friar. Um, the Dominicans were one of those religious orders that, that got started uh, in the, the high Middle Ages, like the Franciscans. And so he's kind of like Anselm, right? He's, Anselm was a monk. This guy's a friar. <coughs> Thomas actually taught uh, at the University of Paris. Um, first he studied there, and then he became a teacher. And I'll tell you just a little bit about him, and then we'll go into some of his, his philosophical ideas. But actually, before we do the philosophical ideas, I'm going to do another one of these polling things and getting, getting some discussion going. But so first, Thomas, um, what should I tell you about him first? They called him the, the dumb ox when he was in school. He was a big, fat guy. Uh, he may have had some sort of glandular problem or something like that. Um, you know, big bone, right? And he didn't talk an awful lot, and most of his other fellow students thought he was actually pretty stupid. Um, it turned out that he wasn't. He turned out to be one of the most brilliant uh, philosophers around. He just didn't talk an awful lot and kept things to himself while he was learning. Uh, some of you may relate to that, right? If you're in sort of a quiet disposition. His teacher, uh, Albert the Great, said, that dumb ox will one day let out a, uh, a roar that will shake all of, of uh, Christendom. And Thomas eventually became one of the most important Christian thinkers of all time. But what he did that was really unique, at least at that time, he wasn't the only person doing this. His teacher was doing this as well. But Thomas did it in a much better way. was to bring together sort of synthesis, philosophy and church doctrine. Um, and philosophy was undergoing a kind of revolution at that time. They had lost most, in, in the West, they had lost most of Aristotle's books. As a matter of fact, if you look at reading lists that we have from these monasteries, there's a lot of literature that they had just lost for a long time and, and luckily had been preserved somewhere else, you know. Uh, in the, some of the Middle Ages, it was actually Irish monks who had preserved some literature, and then it goes through the rest of Europe after the Dark Ages are, are coming to an end. Um, when it came to Aristotle, Aristotle's texts had been preserved by the Arabs, and the Arabs were still in Spain at that time. Spain was still a Muslim area, and they had these, these Greek texts from Aristotle that were being translated first into Latin, and then they finally got their hands on the Greek. And Aristotle was sort of a lightning bolt to them. Um, because Aristotle is sort of like taking a car um, that's, you know, got an okay engine, it's not a sports car or something like that, and then suddenly dropping in the, uh, the engine of a sports car into it. It's supercharged, you know. Um, it goes a lot faster, you got a lot more power. That's the way Aristotle's philosophy was, because Aristotle was so systematic. And one of the things that was different about Aristotle was he focused very much on the world of experience, on what we could see, hear, sense, reason about by pointing at. And not a lot of the other philosophers have done that. Another way that you could think about this is that Thomas is bringing together reason and faith. You know, we, we tend quite often to think of religious faith as if it's something wholly irrational, right? If you ask most people out on the street who will, in general, in this country, at least say they believe in God, right? If you, if you poll most people in the United States, the majority of them say they believe in God. And then you ask them, um, why do you believe it, or can you prove it, or something like that, a lot of them say, ah, you know, I just sort of take it on faith. 
I, I just believe it. I don't know why I believe it. Or um, sometimes they'll get angry at you too. Who are you to question me? Um, sometimes atheists get angry at you too. Uh, I'll tell you a story about that if we have time later. One of my own experiences with that. It was kind of funny. Um, could reason and faith sort of coexist? Does being religious make you less of a thinker? <coughs> That's something worth thinking about. <coughs> does, does being religious mean, say, turning reason off? That's the way uh, some people think about it. Actually, there's some religious people who think about it that way. They, they say that faith is something that you know, is much higher than reason. Reason can never understand it. So quit thinking about stuff, and then you'll actually get it right. There are some who are mystics. There are some who are what we call fideists who have that sort of view. Um, Thomas didn't have that view. He thought that faith and reason sort of fused together. And he thought this because of his views on you know, what God is and his views about human beings. <clears throat> if you think about the philosophers that we've studied so far, how do they view reason in relation to the human being? Reason is part of us, right? Where does it fit? Is it like, you know, on top? Is it on the bottom? Where do you put it? Well, what else is in the human being? We've done a lot of talking about this over the semester. What else do you, do you have in you? Besides a faculty of reason. You're not logical all the time, are you? I'm not. What else do you have in you? silence. What are, what are you feeling right now? Anybody? You can say bored if you want. I'm, I'm okay with that. Maybe it is boring. Or are you thinking about something else outside of class that you're anxious about? A lot of you are sick, so you're probably, you know, you're probably just lethargic and, and uh, would rather be home in bed, right? If you'd rather be home in bed, do you remember what we call that sort of thing? It starts with a D. Desire, right. Reason is something that's in us. Desires are also in us. Your emotions are in you, right? That's, that's a huge part of you. You wouldn't want to just be all reason, no emotions. I certainly wouldn't want you to be all reason, no emotions. Um, you have these appetites, will. We talked about all these different things. So throw all these things together in a big pot and, and call it, you know, um, Mr. So-and-so and Ms. So-and-so. Where does reason go? Does it, does it sink to the bottom or does it float to the top? It goes to the top, right. And reason is the one that can kind of decide what everything else should do. It's the one that actually, you know, reason can understand your emotions. Can your emotions actually understand reason? Aristotle has got this great line about anger where he says, anger is like an over-hasty servant. You've all, you've all been at restaurants <coughs> where the waiter or the waitress is, is paying attention to you, but not that much. And you say, I would like, and they're already off trying to get you something. Have you ever been in a case like that? Um, and then they bring you the wrong thing. You're like, you know, you could have waited until I finished saying something, and then you'd know what I wanted. That's the way Aristotle says anger is. Anger perceives that you've been wrong, and then it starts reasoning out and says, I've been wronged, I better knock that person out. And it jumps you know, right to that, or castigate them, or pick whatever you want. I should punish them. Um, emotions don't really understand reason, although they have their own sort of structure. Reason can understand emotions. Um, what about things of faith, do you think? Well, Thomas thought that reason, human reason, is given to us by God, so that we can understand everything, so that we can use it. Um, somebody was saying, just read the Bible and you're going to be A-OK -okay and don't think about it, that would be totally alien to Thomas Aquinas. He would say that person doesn't actually understand the very religion that they're talking about because they don't understand that, that um, human beings were created as rational creatures. 
this is going to lead us into this discussion about um, arguments for God's existence. But before we go into that, um, let's think about this a little bit more like we did with, with St. Anselm. <coughs> I'm not going to ask, um, I actually had um, little uh, note cards I was going to use as secret ballots with you guys, but I forgot to bring the note cards. Because I'm not going to ask anybody uh, and have them raise their hands who believes in God or who doesn't believe in God uh, in, in the class, because that's kind of a touchy personal issue, right? What I am going to ask you about is this. Let's say you believe in God. What grounds do you have for believing in God? Or let's say you don't believe in God. Why do you think God doesn't exist? What, what grounds do you have for, for saying that? Or let's say, you know, maybe some of you are what we call agnostic. You haven't made up your minds yet. You're, you know, sometimes you think one day it's this way and the other day you think it's that way. Or you say, I, I just don't know, right? Um, what would it take? Yeah. If I was never presented with the idea of a God, then I would have, I want to think that one existed. And I, ah. I don't really think that one exists, to be honest. Yeah. That's, that's an interesting point that if, if you, nobody had brought forth an idea of God, you don't think that you, and probably you think other people too, right, wouldn't have sort of naturally come to that conclusion. And Thomas would actually be kind of sympathetic to that. Um, oftentimes we present these proofs as if, you know, you got natural man walking around in the jungle or, you know, on the plains, and he's looking around and he sees things, and then he says, oh, you know, all of these must have had a cause, we can't trace these causes back all the way. Therefore, there must be a prime mover. Um, let's call that God. And, you know, historically, is that the way things happened? No. So if that's supposed to be a reconstruction of our reasoning process, that's very imaginary. That's almost like a cartoon rather than the real thing. So Thomas isn't saying that. Because um, that would have been, you know, kind of silly to say even in Thomas's time that, well, you just kind of look at things. <laughs> It's, a, it's apparent to you. Um, and people have struggled with this, you know, throughout the millennium. Um, even, even some of the great, you know, religious authors went through their crises of faith. St. Augustine, who you see Thomas talking about, he had these long periods of doubts, and he actually joined a religious cult for a long time, the Manichaeans, before he got out of that. Um, Mother Teresa was a little bit, you know, closer in time to, to us. She just died recently. Any of you remember what the huge news was shortly after she died? This is the nun who was in Calcutta and she was taking care of dying people for 50 years. She started an order of nuns just to take care of the dying. And, you know, that seems like a pretty nice thing to do. And these nuns would, you know, go to mass every day and all that. Does anyone remember what the big bombshell shocker was for this lady? She even lectured President Clinton. He invited her to the, to the prayer dinner, and um, she didn't get invited back because uh, she, um, you know, he came over and he's, you know, doing his typical Clinton thing, you know, glad handing everybody, and, you know, and she said, you know why you've got so many social problems? Because you kill all your children. Um, she said it like that to him. So she's, you know, pretty uh, st straight talker. Well, it turned out, we found, they found her, uh, her diaries after she died. She'd been living the last 50 years um, not feeling the presence of, of God, sort of like being out in the desert, and still carrying on um, what she thought she ought to be doing. She, she believed intellectually that there was a God and that she had an experience of it you know, way back in her youth, and that she didn't have that experience again the rest of her life. And she, yet she stayed true to it. That's guts. You know, that's that's uh, that's pretty tough to do. That'd be sort of like falling in love with somebody uh, at, at your age. You know, uh, freshman year, you meet somebody in your philosophy class, and you fall in love with them, and they're really great for that time, and then they go away on a trip. You guys are planning on getting married, right? They go away on a trip. And no letters, no nothing. And you say, I know that they're out there and they love me. <laughs> and you stick to it for 50 years until you die. That would take some determination, wouldn't it? 
Thomas didn't have that sort of experience. As a matter of fact, Thomas um, felt that he you know, knew God intellectually and, and, and emotionally. So let's look at some of the stuff that, that he says. Again, though, before that, what would it take for people to believe that God exists? Here we get to, you know, grounds for belief. Why do people say that they think God exists? There could be some bad grounds. Think about people you know. People you've run into. Could be the, the evangelist at the street corner. Could be Uncle Joe, you know, who corners you at the family Christmas who wants to know if you've met Jesus. Um, could be uh, anybody you like. Could be somebody trying to convince you God doesn't exist. You know, uh, the Richard Dawkins of the world. Why do people say they, they think God exists? In your experience. Yeah. Some people just want to have something to believe in. Okay, so they, first they desire <coughs> to believe. And then maybe they say, i got to believe in something, it may as well be God. Or, if I'm going to believe in something, I'll believe in the biggest thing I can, and God is that then, which nothing greater can be thought, so I <laughs> believe in that. <clears throat> kind of a, you know, cart before the horse uh, way of uh, putting things together, though, isn't it? But the people do do this. I and mean, there are philosophers who talk about like the, the will to believe and the need to believe. Yeah. Do you like, help them through some big problem in their life, like believing in God, like People, okay. in, people in jail, like you could relate to this. A lot of people in jail yeah. become religious because they, have, they want to have something to believe in that's not terrible. Yeah. Um, and there are religious communities in, in, in the, the prisons. Um, and then, you know, they, they can latch on to, to that. So, how, let's see, how should we differentiate that? They find uh, believing. Say. Find it satisfies some need that they have. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, that's what Thomas would call the argument from authority, which he calls the weakest argument of all. The so and so said so, so it must be true. That's, that's the reason a lot of people do believe, right, For, quite frankly. Because everybody around them said, you know, there's a God, so they said it. What, what else could maybe lead somebody to believing in God? Yeah. Maybe like if they were in some sort of accident and they should have died and they don't die, that sort of thing. Okay, so now we're getting to something that's a little bit, uh, let's call it personal experience. And uh, it could be, you know, they think there's a miracle that took place and therefore there must be a God. Um, some people actually claim to have like had a religious experience where they saw God or saw an angel or things like that. And some, sometimes there are people who really don't want to believe and don't see any purpose in it. Um, and, you know, they were taught to believe in God but they rejected it a long time ago. They say, yeah, this sensation of peace washed over me or you know, all sorts of things along those lines. Uh, so religious experience could be a, a reason. Uh, any other reasons people might believe in God? I asked you last class if any of you were convinced by Anselm's argument. And that was about, you know, sort of unpacking the idea of God. And a few of you said that, yeah, I find Anselm convincing. So I'm going to assume that there's at least some people who are Convinced by, you get an idea and you play around with the idea, and there you go, God exists. Um, and we could, you know, debate whether that's that's a good way to, to do it or not. But that that is why some people do. Any other reasons people might believe in God? This is kind of interesting because, as our culture, we're very far removed from where Thomas Aquinas was. Thomas Aquinas is not going to appeal to any of these. As a matter of fact, he sees these as reasons that you shouldn't put trust in. 
Just the mere fact that somebody taught you to believe, Thomas would say, that's not a good reason to believe in God. Think about it. You, what, are you, what are you claiming about, you know, that you know about when you're talking about this God thing? You're talking about this thing that created the universe and, you know, has absolute power, uh, is omniscient, um, super good, you know, so good that he can bring good out of evil. Um, you're going to say that you believe in that because somebody just told you that's the case? Wow. That's not rational, Thomas would say. Wouldn't you rather have some, you know, stronger grounds than just somebody told me that? Because people tell you all sorts of things. I, I, I told um, my kids that um, there's a monster that comes at night, and uh, this isn't a very nice thing to do, but I, I did it. Um, that comes at night and steals naughty children. And they, you know, they, they, they see through that stuff fairly quickly. But for a little while, my daughter was convinced and they actually went and asked some other adults about that. Um, that's not a good reason to believe in things. Um, personal experience. Do you see any problems with personal experience? If, just because you had an experience of God, does that mean that I should trust it? Maybe there's something wrong with your brain. You, you got hit in the head and saw a bright light and you know, threw the word God out there? Is that a reason why I should, you know, change the way I live? <clears throat> Probably not. It might be a good convincing reason for you, but it's, it's not going to transfer to me. Um, actually, t Thomas uh, rejects this notion that you can just take the idea of God and unpack it and get that. So let's, let's move on to, to that. There's another way of arguing for the existence of God, and that's looking at what we call cause and effect. Doing what we call metaphysics. And why did none of you suggest that as you know the obvious way in which we should try to convince somebody that God exists? Because we don't do a lot of metaphysics in this society, do we? We don't think about what lies behind the appearances. This is a sort of foreign thing for us. Um, and we're not actually going to look at all of his five ways. Thomas gives you five ways of uh, arguing for God's existence. Before we do that, let's look at some of the ground clearing stuff. In this, this uh, question, Thomas asks you, Thomas asks us, as well as himself, three things. Is God's existence <coughs> evident? Then he asks, um, can it be demonstrated or proven? And then he finally asks whether God exists. This is, this is kind of a good way to do things, isn't it? Instead of just starting out with, um, uh, yeah, let's jump right into whether God exists or not. Maybe we should try to figure out whether we can actually prove any of this stuff. Maybe we can't. Maybe some of the, the religious people and also some of the people who are, who are atheists are right in saying, ah, you can't prove it one way or another. Um, we should get this stuff out of the way. You know, some people think that God's existence is self-evident, that it's just everybody should be able to see this, just like that. Um, and if they can't, there's something wrong with them. They're dummies. Or they're just perverse, or something like that. Thomas doesn't think that's the case. Um, here's some of the arguments that, that people make in favor of that. They say, um, you know, those things can be said to be self-evident, the knowledge of which is naturally implanted in us. And, you know, some people think that God has, you know, put the knowledge of, of God into us as human beings. So we just have to think about it a little bit, and then we'll, we'll automatically see it or feel it or something like that. Thomas says, yeah, sort of, but it's awfully confused. Um, 
um, and, he, and he gives this great example. If you see somebody coming towards you at night, you know somebody's coming towards you. <coughs> Do you know who that is? Not until they actually get into the light. It's the same way with knowledge. There are some things that are self-evident to us, in a sense, but they're not very distinct. And think about all the different things people have said are God over the course of time. What are some of the things people have worshipped as God that you could think of of him? Anything you remember? I don't maybe the, maybe you guys didn't talk about this in history classes or or um, humanities classes or literature classes. Do they not talk about this anymore in school? Things that people worship? Is it too controversial to, to hit on? You know, I, if I wanted to, I could, I could make my own church, and I could say, we need to worship this loaf of bread. And if I said it long and hard enough, somebody would come to believe it. <coughs> it wouldn't make this God, would it? So why you brought the bread? No, I, I, I bought it at the bake sale, because uh, I needed some bread for tonight, and it was fortuitous that they happened to be up there. Um, and then actually I thought, oh, I should have you know, like bought cupcakes or something for you guys, but I didn't. <laughs> but you know, most of you are sick anyway, so you wouldn't you wouldn't really get that much out of it. But that's how I'm going to console myself. Um, anyway, Thomas says, okay, yeah, there's some sort of natural idea in us, but that's not enough to go on. And then you notice in the second one, what does he talk about? Well, you know, some people say God is that than which nothing greater can be thought. Where have we heard that before? Just Anselm. last week, Saint Anselm. Right? Thomas is rejecting Saint Anselm's argument. He's saying that St. Anselm is saying, all you got to do is think about the idea of God and you realize he has to exist. Thomas says that doesn't work. Um, let's look at the next one. Some people say that you can't prove one way or another whether God exists. And um, one of the objections that I want to look at really closely is this one. They say, it seems that the existence of God cannot be demonstrated. For it's an article of faith that God exists. But what is of faith cannot be demonstrated, because a demonstration produces scientific knowledge, whereas faith is of the unseen. So there are some religious people that would be very uncomfortable with the notion that you could prove that God exists, because they say, if you do that, you're taking away people's faith. And faith is something good, right? So if you're taking away their faith, because faith and knowledge can't sort of Faith and knowledge can't be in the same thing at the same time, they're saying. Because faith is believing in something that you don't know, and just believing in it. And knowledge is actually being able to, to give an account of it, being able to understand it. Um, I think you've probably all encountered some, some people whose religious orientation is along these lines, right? Don't, don't think about it, just believe. And if you do think about it, then sometimes they think that you're not believing and you're not really a good Christian or a good Muslim or a good Hindu or pick whatever you want. Thomas rejects that. Thomas thinks that, again, faith and reason do in fact overlap. So he uses them both, you might say, sort of like two horses that have been paired together. Um, let's look at now, very quickly, because we don't have that much time left in the class, a few of these five ways. <coughs> um, well, actually, before that, I'm going to look at one of the objections, because remember we talked about the problem of evil last, last class. Thomas actually talks about this here. Does God actually exist? One of the great arguments against God existing is actually what we call the problem of evil. There's really only two hardcore, uh, put up a lot of objection arguments against God's existence. I mean, somebody can say, ah, we don't, we don't see God, you know, I, I look around and I don't see him down the hall or something like that. That's not really an argument because God isn't the sort of thing that you would, you know, is he under the eraser? No, nope, not there. Um, therefore, he doesn't exist. That doesn't work. There's two things that are good, you know, pretty good arguments. One is called the argument from evil. And it works like this. You say, okay, God is omniscient, right? Because that's what we mean by God. God knows everything. 
God is all-powerful, right? Again, that's what we mean by God. God is all good. Again, it's something we mean by God. So why is there evil in the world? Why are some of you sick in class today? Why do people kill each other over terrible reasons? Why are there infants who get cancer? Um, that's evil of one form or another. Why does that exist? Isn't that incompatible with, with this notion of God? And Thomas has one answer to this in, in here. There, there are many answers that are given to this. The answer that he gives, he's actually taken from Augustine. Augustine says, um, since God is the highest good, he would not allow any evil to exist in his works unless his omnipotence and goodness were such as to bring good even out of evil. So being sick could be good because it allows you to feel solidarity and empathy with other people who are sick and then to be a better person. Um, is, that, is that what all of you who are sick are going to do today? Are you exercising your empathy? Maybe not. Right? Um, but you could be. It's kind of hard to see how this would work for some things, like a, like a child getting cancer. Isn't it? Or a child being terribly abused. It's hard to see how that would that, that argue, the argument that Thomas is giving would work for that. Um, but there are other arguments that can be given. Yeah? Does he believe in like the greater good of things? Like that some things need to be like, not that I'm saying that any no, it's a good, good, good question. good, but like the person that may have died when they were like five years old is going to be a bad individual when they grew up or something? Would that work with what you just said? Well, that would work for some of them, I suppose. Because, you know, on the average, some people turn out good and some people turn yeah. out bad, right? But for any one given, let's say, a kid who gets leukemia, right? We call him Sam, and he dies when he's, when he's five. Um, only God knows whether that kid would have been good or evil overall. Um, and there may be many Sams who would have been good, and, and God allowed them to, to die of natural causes um, when he could have done a miracle, presumably, right? Omnipotent. So I, I don't think that this argument would actually get you out of the problem of evil. Thomas is giving. There are other ones. We're not going to talk about them in this class, but if you're really interested in that, there's a philosophy of religion class. Maybe I'll put a little uh, together a little talk on this next semester. I don't know. Um, the other objection is you don't actually need God in the picture to make thing, make sense out of things. He says it's superfluous to suppose that what could be accounted for by a few principles has been produced by many. But it seems that everything we see in the world can be accounted for by other principles, supposing that God did not exist. All natural things can be reduced to one principle, nature. Right? Why does, uh, why does this piece of chalk fall? Gravity, right? And gravity is part of nature, the way the world works. Why am I walking across the room right now? Is, is, is anything making me do that? Remember when we talked about Aristotle and talked about Epictetus and, and free will? I'm making myself move across the room. My will is doing it. And so maybe just by will and nature, that's enough to explain everything. You know, add, add in evolution, but what is evolution? Evolution is just nature. <coughs> Right? We have complicated theories, but they all boil down to nature. Physicists think that there's four basic forces that govern everything in the universe, and they're always trying to figure out how can we roll these into just one basic force. Um, so we're gonna, I'm not going to try to remember them offhand because I usually forget one of them. Thomas says, well, actually, you can't explain everything without bringing God into the picture. This is where Thomas's contribution is kind of interesting. Thomas will talk about the the observable world, what you see, smell, hear, what you observe, right? Why do things happen in the world as you know? Like that chalk that I dropped that broke and rolled away somewhere. <coughs> What made that happen? Me, yeah, okay, so it had some sort of cause, actually a bunch of causes, like gravity, there's a 
cause. My letting it fall was a cause. I was keeping it suspended from gravity. Um, if I take this desk, and it's just sitting there right now, and I push it over there, I'm, I'm moving it, right? That's changing it. When I take this bread, and I rip it into pieces, or I slice it, I'm changing that bread. And then I'll be changing it some more, because I'm going to be putting it into my mouth, and chewing on it, and then swallowing it, provided nothing goes wrong, right? Along the way, somehow, something weird happens. I'm going to be changing this bread pretty soon into energy, and then putting it back into cells. And if I don't exercise, I'll get more fat cells. You know? that's, that's energy being stored. So there's this world that we observe, and science talks about this, the world of change. The world of causes leading to effects. Now, can a cause itself be an effect of something else? What do you think? Think about when you're shooting a pool. Any of you shoot pool? Okay, so you got a couple balls on the table. If you only have one ball left on the table, um, then uh, either you won the game or you lost the game. You scratched on the eight ball. It could be the cue ball that's left over, right? Um, either way, the game's over. So long as you're playing pool, there's more than one ball on the table. And what are you doing in pool? I know you're shooting at pockets. That's your aim. That's your telos, your goal. But what are you actually doing physically? You've all seen people shoot pool, right? What are you doing? What's, it, what's involved in it? You know there's balls, because I've already said that. Yeah? You hit one ball, then it hits into another one? Yeah, and what do you, what do you hit that ball with? Um, you just like, stick. it. No, you, yeah, you have to shoot it with a pool stick. So now think about that. There's already a complex system of causes there. Why does that, let's say you're shooting the nine ball in, why does that nine ball go in the pocket? <coughs> what got it moving? The cue ball that hit it. Let's say so you're not doing a complex shot, right? What got that cue ball moving? The stick that you hit it with. What got that stick moving? You did. <coughs> and you chose to do that because you had some sort of desire. That desire moved you. So you can have a cause, and that cause can itself be the effect of another cause. And you can keep going further and further back. Think about, you know, when we talked about Aristotle and efficient cause. Why are you actually here? There, is, there were, uh, I guess we could say two efficient causes um, that, that produced you. What were they? Give you a hint. They have the same name when you're kids for all of you. Yeah. Uh, your parents, your mom. Mom and dad. Yeah. Um, each contributed some genetic material. They came together, and you didn't miscarry, and here you are. Um, there are efficient causes of you. How'd your parents get here? Did they just pop out of the ground? You've probably met the people who made your parents. The grandparents? Grandparents, right. We can keep tracing this all the way back if we want to. And you can say, you know, let's say you believe in the, the biblical story, everybody came from Adam and Eve. Um, you still have a problem, right? Where did they come from? And you can keep going back further and further and further and further. And you can do this with all sorts of things. You can do this with efficient causality, with motion, you can do this with um, why things are arranged the way they are, um, you know, the, 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 the telos or the design behind them, uh, but it always comes back to the same thing. Can you go back forever? What do you think? Can you have what they call an infinite regress? So that there wouldn't be any starting clause. What would get things going in the first place, then? That'd kind of be a problem, wouldn't it? it, it so if, if nothing got anything going in the first place, then what's all this stuff that we're observing right now? What's you being here? 
and iPhones existing, you know, which took an awful lot of causes and effects uh, taking place, and my existing. How did all this come to be if nothing ever got it started? Well, that would be a problem, wouldn't it? Now, some people will say stuff like, well, the Big Bang. You notice the Big Bang, by the way, is a very recent scientific theory. <clears throat> For quite a long time, um, scientists thought, no, the world was actually eternal. It didn't, didn't begin in time. <clears throat> and the Big Bang was kind of a revolutionary thing. By the way, it was a priest who came up with that notion of the Big Bang. Um, thinking in terms of, you know, uh, sort of the, the transcendent God that caused everything kind of liberates your mind to think in, in these sort of terms. You could also say, you know, why are human beings the way they are? Evolution. But why are those things the way they are? See, what you're asking about here is not just the phenomenon. You're asking about the, what we call intelligibility. Intelligibility. The answer to the, the why. Why are things the way they are? What made the Big Bang get started in the first place? You could say it just happened, it just, just turned out that way. Um, is that a satisfying answer? What do you think? Were you satisfied when you were a kid and you'd ask your parents, why is this the way it is? And then you know, you'd, you'd kind of bother them for a while because they'd put up with you and they'd say, um, well, you have to understand this and this and this, and they'd say, why is it that way? And now they're starting to get a little irritated. Well, it's like this and this and this. And then, why is it like that? And then finally they, they said either <clears throat> one of two things. They either said, shut up, <laughs> if you had mean parents. Or they said, because, if you had nice parents. <laughs> Was that satisfying? Mm -hmm. Just because. This is, this is what Thomas is trying to get at, that... If you don't have some sort of cause <clears throat> that could actually get all of this going, um, you can't get the whole project off the ground. We know that the whole project is off the ground because we actually experience it. And so we're going from a world of experience, and we're going back to what is, um, let's say, the world of metaphysics. And how are we doing that? We're reasoning. And what is this ultimately supposed to lead us back to? God. You notice that he ends each one of his arguments for God's existence with the same phrase. Um, he says, it's necessary to arrive at a first mover put in motion by no other, the thing that gets everything else going. And this, everyone understands to be God. Uh, and then, you know, the second one, he says, it's, it's necessary to admit a first efficient cause, to which everyone gives the name God. Um, we cannot but postulate the existence of some being having of itself its own necessity and not receiving it from another but rather causing, all, causing in all others their necessity. This all men speak of as, as God. And he keeps going on and on like this. He's saying that this essentially metaphysical concept, this philosophical concept of the first cause that got everything going, that's the same thing as Jews, Christians, Muslims, Hindus, people who you know, talk about God mean when they use that term. Um, now notice, this is, this is pretty different than... You know, the God who um, does this or that in the Bible. This, this isn't necessarily a God who talks to people. You could actually be what we call a deist and, and uh, not a Christian or not a Muslim and believe in a God who gets everything rolling and then just sort of leaves everything alone. Um, a lot of the founding fathers of the United States were, in fact, what we call deists. It comes from the word for God, and they thought that God gets the whole ball rolling, and uh, sets everything up, puts like a moral law in us that we can discover, and then leaves everything to its own devices. Thomas himself didn't, didn't think that. Um, and Thomas has other reasons for that, but they're not contained <coughs> in this, this, this question, this article. What we're getting from this 
is a set of arguments for why there has to be some sort of, we can call it a transcendent cause for everything. Why does he have five different arguments? Well, there's at least five different ways we can understand this. One is sort of like billiard balls. Motion, change. Another one has to do with order in the universe, what we call the argument from design. Um, you know, if you look at, I was just at the doctor today, and um, you look at those charts that they have on the wall, and you see how complicated your knees are, you know, or your backbone, or, and you look at that stuff and you're like, wow, that must have taken some, some thinking. How did that end up like that? I mean, look at all these tendons and ligaments, and they all got to be in just the right place. And they're actually set up to compensate for each other. So if one of them gets screwed up, the other one actually, like, takes up the slack, you know. And, and think about this, the stuff you've made in your lifetime. You know, if you've done any putting, you know, puttering around with Legos or Tinker Toys or stuff like that, how quick the stuff we bro made broke, right? Um, you had your little Lego car, and you rolled it down, and bang, it broke into a million pieces. Your, your knee is a lot more complicated than that. How did that end up like that? Well, you know, one answer is evolution, right? It's, it's better that our knees are like this. And then we can walk around. We don't have to, you know, be like apes, you know, walking like this or something. Um, well, you can keep pushing these things back further and further and further. And I'm not actually myself endorsing the argument from design here as a philosopher, I, I, um, I actually see some, some trouble with it myself. But a lot of people think that if you just look at physical phenomena and look at the way the universe is ordered, it looks like things must have been designed for a purpose. Like think about your eyeball. You ever looked at an eye? You know, <coughs> go to the optometrist and you see all the parts to the eye. How did that come together out of all the goop that was cells? at one time. It's awfully complicated, isn't it? You know, Darwin himself, when he wrote about this, he said, yeah, the eye, I have real trouble explaining that one. Things like, you know, birds' beaks or, you know, our, our fingers being the way they are, even emotions, that stuff's pretty easy. The eyeball, that's a tough one. I have a real hard time explaining that one, how, how it got that way. You've got to make kind of a leap of faith in evolution. Well, what's your experience of things in the world when it comes to causes and effects? If there isn't a designer for things, do things usually turn out very structured, very orderly, very patterned? Even when you have a designer, they get screwed up, right? Who, I forget, who's in fashion here? So, um, throw together a bunch of scraps of fabric. What do you get? Well, I'm merchandising, so I don't actually design. But you wouldn't really get clothes. Yeah, you, you get a pile of things. Yeah, a pile of things. And let's say you just sort of sewed them at random then. You get a <laughs> Maybe you get a quilt out of it. Um, but if you want to make something like a, you know, an actual, like let's say, just think about this sweater I'm wearing. This is pretty tricky, pretty complicated. It's got it required a lot of machine processes. Somebody actually had to design this. I'm pretty sure this didn't, didn't you know, develop on the sweater tree or something by itself. Um, the argument from design works that way in thinking about the world of phenomena that we know. Could, could you know, your uh, body, um, could this world that we experience have turned out the way that it does without some sort of intelligent force driving it? <coughs> if you say no, then you're, along, you're thinking along the same lines as Thomas. You think there's some sort of transcendent designer um, who, you know, maybe put the fabric of things together the way that they are. <coughs> so, we didn't get very deep into to Thomas's uh, arguments. I actually have another video. If you're interested in going further with this, I have a video from a class that I taught a while ago that I'll post for you guys if you're interested in going further with these, these groups. But you see the general idea, right? This is very different than what Anselm was doing. Anselm was working with the idea. Thomas is looking at the world and trying to get us back to what's behind the world, what's 
what's the metaphysics lying behind the appearances. So, see all of you uh, next Monday.